I would like to get right into our lesson because there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, if you're tracking the lessons, this is the third iteration of walking in the Spirit. I'd like to start off by saying I'm looking at a note that someone had left on our voicemail. And I don't want to reveal the person's name because I don't think it would be appropriate. But she left this voicemail and she said, do we cast out demons? I'm going through some stuff. It reminds me of a person who called up the prayer line and uh, the individual said that they had type 2 diabetes and they wanted someone to believe with them to deliver them from this type 2 diabetes. Now, just as I'm going to get back to this young lady who asked that question, because God is able to deliver us from all things. Any demonic, demonic, uh, demonic oppression or possession. And I don't believe that a child of God can be demon possessed. But I clearly believe a child of God could be demon oppressed. No question about it. But the reason why I use that example as well as the diabetes issue. Because I don't believe there's anything too hard for God. Amen. That's right. In fact, there's a rhetorical question that the Bible says, is there right. anything too hard for God? Which only requires one response. No. And the question that I would have for the person who wants to be delivered from the type 2 diabetes or type 1, whichever the type, God is a healer. The question that I would have is, once you deliver it, so what? Meaning, have you dealt with the issues that caused the diabetes to come in the first place? Yes, sir. Because how many know, no matter how many healings you got, unless there's a material difference in how you live your life, That's right. whatever oppressed you is going to come back and may come back with a vengeance. Yeah. Now, it's fairly uh, obvious for most people that one of the greatest ways to deal with diabetes, in fact, every doctor says the same thing, you don't even have to go to the doctor, you can go to the web, and there are two things that they talk about, diet and exercise. And I'm kind of wondering, might you be able to heal yourself? If you had the right kind of behaviors and patterns, I'm going somewhere with this, as opposed to you looking for a magic wand or a magic bullet for somebody to lay their hands on you only to have temporary satisfaction but not life transformation. Amen. And so when we talk about walking in the authority of God, we're not playing games here. The devil is in for keeps. He's interested in taking people out. He is the author of confusion. He's meaning to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is his job. And so when we talk about walking in our authority, there is two aspects to that walk. Obviously, it's through the power of God in us. But it's also the exercising of that power through us. And that means we have some things to do. And so as we talk about walking in the spirit, that means that there's intentionality, there's deliberate effort, there's some things that you must do. You can't be dependent upon God to do the things that God is telling you to do. Somebody say amen. amen. I think oftentimes children of God are lazy. Yeah. God is not going to do what you need to do. And you can't do what he can do. There is mutuality. There is interdependence in walking in the spirit. And that's why we want to talk about it. Not only in a spiritual way, but in a natural way. 
We talked about this world system and the pull and the allurement of this world system on the child of God, without question. But we also know that God, according to the epistle of Colossians, He has delivered us with all power and all authority. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. That's what the Word of God says. We have all the resources at our disposal to make a material difference in this world. You know, I brought my hat here. I like wearing it because I use it as a witnessing tool. Because I like, you know, people when they see me with the hat on, oh, I can see, they didn't say old, but I can see the expression on their face. And one guy, when I went to the cleaners, he said, you know, I respect you. I said, what do you mean? You don't know me. He said, because you're doing what I would want to do. That kind of hurt to some extent because I'm thinking, man, you care so much, the implication, you care so much about what people think that you're not willing to demonstrate your profession, your, your confession. You say you love God, do you walk in Him? My point is a lot of folks profess but don't possess. That's really what I'm at. And so the question is, when you say you want to walk in the Spirit, do you? I mean, really, do you? Is your lifestyle exemplary of what you say? That's all I'm really saying, because words are powerful. Amen. Come on, Pastor. You want to be delivered. We are the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what the word of God says in 1 Timothy. And we are the means by which this world knows Jesus. They don't know him any other way. Jesus hasn't come back yet. He sent back his power. And his power is not meant to be dormant. It is to be resident in the lives of believers so that they will know the reality of serving a true and living God. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we must walk in the Spirit. And so, as you all know, as our ministers and teachers know that we are interested in inductive Bible study. You know, inductive Bible study means you have to deal with the observation, you have to deal with the interpretation, and then you make your application. So let's look a little bit about, a little bit at, rather, this book of Galatians, because that's where we're going to be.